Good morning. We're happy to have so many of you join us today. My name is Caroline Sandoval, Education and Outreach Manager at the Hayward Area Historical Society. We are excited to have artist and climate activist Jennifer Coney with us today to discuss climate activism and the art that it inspired. Jennifer is a retired recreational professional who supervised nature programs, camps, and cultural arts programs for the City of Oakland and our very own Hayward Shoreline Interpretive Center and Sulphur Creek Nature Center. Without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Coney. Great, thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, and you're here to uh, participate in Art as a Doorway. It's my climate activism story and uh, many thanks to the Hayward Historical Society. Um, I, I want to start off with a big thank you. So if we can go to the next slide, slide please. Thanks, Marcia. So gratitudes, deep, deep gratitudes to the Hayward Historical Society for hosting this and especially to you, Carolyn Sandoval, for making this happen, for coordinating this, for just making it easy for me. Thank you so much. And I also want to give a shout out to Marces Owings, who's the tech person behind all of this. Thank you, Marces. I really appreciate you being there and for your support in the Hayward Historical Society. Um, I did want to give a shout out to the Hayward Arts Council, Winda Shimizu. Thank you, Winda, for connecting me and us to the Hayward Historical Society. And lastly, I want to thank you, the participants here. Thank you for joining us one by one. We keep on getting a few more attending and I really appreciate your presence. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for your time and for your attention and for your curiosity about what can you do next for, in order to support the climate. So um, before we get, uh, let me give you an overview with this slide here. We're gonna um, connect to each other a little bit before we get started, um, connect to the climate in an exercise I'm gonna lead you through. And then I'm hoping, then I'll tell my story and show some of my art practice and some of my paintings and some other things that are happening currently in terms of climate actions and, and resources that you can uh, use to support your climate activism. And I'm hoping that my story is an inspiration to you to take collective action for the climate. All right, let's go to the next slide here, Marces. Thanks. Now, this is the Hayward shoreline. It's significant to me in many ways. Plus, it's just a beautiful thing to look at. Uh, so I, we're, I'm located in Hayward, as is the Hayward Historical Society. And I fell in love with this place, the vastness of it, the beauty of it. And I, if nothing else, I'm a sucker for beauty. So it's, I find more and more that resting in beauty is an important practice. So um, to get us started, I'd like to just ground ourselves in this place. If you would, please, I'm inviting you um, to take a breath with me. We'll take three breaths and I will lead you. So we can ground in this place, ground with our breath and ground in this moment. All right, so find yourself settled. And we'll take three deep, slow breaths, breathing out and breathe in and hold, and breathe out, and hold, and breathe in, hold, and breathe out, hold, last breath in, hold, and breathe out, and let it go. So, Breath is climate. The air around us is the climate. We've just partaken a breath together in this moment, in this climate, and together. So congratulations, you've just taken a collective climate action together. <laughs> so, so moving on, let me tell you my story. And oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. We wanna, we wanna say a climate action that you have taken that's not just breathing. So I'm gonna ask you who are here, if you could please, in the chat box, can you type in a climate action you have taken, please? 
just any climate action, come on and join me. I need to know that there are people out there. So in the chat, just if you could put one, a climate action, no matter how small, how big that you have ever taken. Okay, good. We've got one that's composting. Composting is a climate. Yeah. It looks like we have lost a connection with Jennifer Coney, but if you'll just hang with us for a second, here she is. Okay, cool. Are we good, Carolyn? We are good to go. You're welcome to get started. Sorry about that. Okay, great. So yeah, so now we'll move on to the part where, it, so the point of this is there's a reason that you took an action, if any. You know, like why did you move from just knowing to acting? And that's what my story is about. So let's move to the next slide. Let me share with you my story. So there's a couple things you have to know about me before, uh, before we can kind of fill in the blanks and get to the climate action part. First of all, I'm an artist. Um, I've got a, a bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan in textiles, and I've got a master's of fine arts from San Francisco State. Uh, and that master's is in, among other things, baseball. And it's installation art. There's an image right there. If you want to know more, you're going to have to take me to a ball game and I'll explain it to you. Okay. <laughs> That's a long story. Uh, let's see. So after that, I was working for the city of Oakland Office of Parks and Recreation. I started teaching kids art at Studio One Art Center in Oakland and then became in charge of citywide cultural arts, creating the Oakland Fine Arts Summer School and ultimately ended up as Recreation General Supervisor, supervising half the rec centers in Oakland. After that, I left and came to Hayward, Hayward Area Recreation and Park District, where I was a recreation supervisor until I retired six years ago. And I oversaw programs, including the nature programs and the Hayward Shoreline Interpretive Center. That's when I fell in love with the Hayward Shoreline. I recognized it. It became my refuge as well as something to care for. So if we can have the next slide. Thank you. So as part of my work assignment, I was a representative for Hayward Area Recreation and Park District on a three-year 36 agency study to discover what were the possible impacts of sea level rise on the shoreline between the geographic area of Emeryville and Union City. It was called the Adapting to Rising Tides Regional Project, and it was from January of 2011 to October 2013. I'm going to mention at this point that besides Hayward Area Recreation and Park District, there was also the City of Hayward who was participating in this and East Bay Regional Park District. So there we were working on doing this work to understand what are the possible impacts of sea level rise on our sh beloved shoreline and midway the reports started coming out. Uh, and they started to show what the sea level rise could be at that time locally uh, on the Hayward shoreline. And so knowing this was a place that I had come to know very well and love, when I saw the reports of 55 inches of sea level rise by the year 2100, it, I broke down, I cried. It's not often <laughs> that I don't think I've ever cried at a, on a, reading a report, let alone a technical scientific report. <laughs> huh. But it was, it, it touched me, it went from information to this deep knowing and that I was just compelled to respond. It wasn't a decision, it was my response. My response was twofold. I started painting again and I wanted people to know. So there was educational programs at the Hayward Shoreline Interpretive Center communicating the results of this scientific report to the community, especially to the community along the shoreline that would be impacted. And I started painting. So let's go to the next slide here. So over the course of a year, I painted a series of seven large scale paintings. Okay, they're behind me right here and on doors. So literally doors without the handle holes um, from Home Depot. 
uh, 32 inches by 80 inches. So they're human sized. And I, I used a process of resist and pour painting that I developed. And um, I'll get into the process later so you can see some of the details behind the screen and in the studio. But each of the paintings has a horizon line of 55 inches, that same 55 inches. So the paintings sit on the floor and the viewer standing in front of it physically feel what is 55 inches so that they can physically experience the expected amount of sea level rise. Next, please. Thanks. So let me talk a little bit about this resist and pour painting process technique that I developed. Um, so uh, as I said, I have a background in textiles. So things like batik use wax and string to keep the dye from going to certain areas of the fabric when you dip it all in. So that played into this development of this process of resist technique. And then um, I would use cold water wax, uh, tape, silver leaf, paper to protect the drawn and painted images that I created. So I'd first paint the image of icebergs, ice, glaciers, etc., and then I'd protect it. So the middle slide shows the, the cold water wax and the one on the right shows where the silver leaf is. And then I would inundate the painting with poured paint all over the drawing and the painting and different colors. So there'd be dark blue, white paint, et cetera. Uh, turquoise, it's uh, the, that glacier blue. Um, and then we'd see what happens after that. So the protection and the inundation was both the process and the subject. Next slide, please. Thanks. So here, here's, you know, a picture of the big bucket of liquidy paint just being poured right before I'm pouring or as I'm pouring on top of one, I think that's the iceberg painting. And you'll notice that some of the paint beads up in the areas that it won't stick to and others just drip down and others are kind of like somewhat sticking and not. So that's the process. Next slide. And then there'd be this, uh, the next process. Oh, okay, more images of what that looks like up close. So you can see where it sticks or doesn't stick, where it covers and, and pours over. So everything I painted might be covered and you wouldn't necessarily see what's underneath. It's now hidden. Okay, next, inundated, so to speak. Ah, then there's this transformation process. Once all of that dried and the, I would, take these big boards out, these paintings in process in the backyard, get a hot water tea kettle, a hose and a scrub brush and buckets of water and scrub the heck out of it. So removing the top layer to see what paint sticks, what paint does it and not knowing what would really show up in the end. So it was kind of this mystery transformation process, this cleansing, this ritual, you know, if we talk about ritual a little bit, um, it's a process of protecting the image. And before knowing that inundation would come afterwards, meaning the pouring over of paint, became kind of like a prayer, kind of like a wish, kind of like a hope, kind of like a, a protect, yeah, a prayer more than anything else. And a statement, it's like, we've got to protect the ice and knowing that the inundation would come. And then afterwards, that scrubbing, that cleansing, that transformation to see what is left and then work with that and present it. So that's what, that's the process. That's how it became a, a ritual of sorts as the process happened and then the final result. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks, Marces. Okay, so here we go. Here are the images. So there's that, the final product. Now realizing these are door sizes, so you're seeing it on a tiny little screen probably. Um, and if you were to stand in front of it, that line, that horizon line would come right about to your shoulder. So here's iceberg on the left and global warming on the right. And uh, the, the image on the right with the sky is all 
silver leaf. So it has this glowing reflective quality and you'll see some of that in some of the other paintings as well. Okay, next slide. And then there's ice flow on the left and carbon footprint on the right. Um, that's one of, that's this one right here. And I actually used a stencil of my foot to create the negative space carbon footprint. And then the white turns into the ice in a positive negative kind of shift. And that uh, bird up there in the iceberg right here. So how the iceberg turns into a bird of sorts. Thank goodness for artistic license. That is the canary, the, so to speak, the canary in the coal mine. The ice is our canary in the coal mine. Okay, next please. Great. And then soot hit holes also with some of those carbon footprints in the sky and that energy balance and uh, referencing those shadow holes that dig down into with the melting in the glaciers. And then glacial lake, uh, the ultimate um, beginnings of the demise of um, an ice sheet. Okay, next please. So, um, oh, and then finally there's 450 ppm parts per million and the iceberg with being held up by strands of silver leaf lines as a close up on the right. So why 450, let me just explain that. So James Hansen, the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies estimates that if we were to reach a consistent level of 450 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, that there would be irreversible melting of the ice sheets and the ice is so necessary. So you can tell I fell in love with ice. Current level that we hit on June 6 was 412.5. Okay, so next slide. So what do you do with all these paintings? Well, it required an exhibit. So uh, we had to get it out there somehow, have people experience it. Now, here's where it gets interesting in the sense that I realized I wasn't alone in this. So a friend of mine introduced me to Oliver Klink. He's a renowned international nature photographer who at the same time that I was in the studio painting my images of glaciers and iceberg was in the Arctic um, in, uh, photographing wildlife and ice uh, images um, in his impeccable style. So when he brought his images to me and I brought my paintings out, there were some that just, they used the same colors. They looked like dif different representations of the same object. And it was quite remarkable. So since his were so very um, uh, detailed nature photography and mine were more abstracted images of it, we called it abstraction meets reality, 55 inches images of sea level rise. And we took this exhibit on the road um, for three years. We went um, to over 10 galleries, libraries, recreation centers, community centers, a community college, all throughout the Bay Area, including, um, let's see, we went to Monterey Bay, we went to Santa Rosa, Petaluma, San Pablo, of course, Hayward, Castro Valley, all sorts of places, anywhere we could, we exhibited uh, these images and presented along with it, uh, a presentation of the findings of the report and sea level rise and things that you could do to get further involved. And that was called What? Sharks in My Backyard? And with that presentation and these exhibits, we reached over 500 people uh, just explaining them. So if we can have some of the next slides, please. Thanks. So here's Oliver on the left with his images. Here am I talking to some friends about what does it mean there's the blue line of the 55 inches. So uh, trying to engage and using the images to bring people in to have a conversation. And uh, so over the course, like I said, it was three years or so that we exhibited this and it continues to exhibit. I've had some of the paintings at the Castro Valley Library recently. Um, so you'll see them popping up here and there as a tool for just getting people involved, just like we're doing now. Next slide, please. And there we go, a couple more images of the uh, exhibits. And one more slide, please. 
Yeah, and here I am speaking to a group with the slideshow. I've been doing this a little bit, talking about all the things, uh, you know, more of the data and options that you can take. Um, so um, it was very, very enriching. And um, I hope we reached people in a way that um, helped them think more about it. But then I soon realized that we had to do more than to act on our own and that information was not enough. Next slide, please. So I love this quote from Bill McKibben, who was the founder of 350.org. And uh, the best thing we can do, the best thing an individual can do right now is to be less of an individual. <laughs> so partnership, we have to amplify our efforts and by doing, by combining is how we amplify. So just to clarify what the 350 reference is, because some people ask me, 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide has been identified as the safe upper limit to avoid a climate tipping point. So 350.org uh, works hard on many different levels on a national scale to, uh, to work towards getting to that level of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay, next slide, please. So when it became clear that we had to work collectively, I chose a couple organizations to connect with in order to amplify my efforts. Uh, the first one is 350 Bay Area Action, uh, whose motto is more climate action, less hot air. And uh, the link is in the group. Uh, I actually am on the legislative team. I'm a co-chair, uh, co I guess you'd say, of the End Fossil Fuels Action Team, where we have uh, a dozen members now tracking, how many bills are we tracking now? 13 bills that are currently in the California state legislation process. Uh, so we're in the heat of it right now. The bills have just moved from one house to the other. And these bills are ones that effectively move the climate agenda forward. And we do everything from attend hearings virtually to speak up and say me too's, to sign group letters, to send in individual letters, to meet with legislators, um, advocating for, and we're all volunteers. We have action alerts, we, we promote um, people, it's engagements and um, engagement in the issue. And we represent 18,000 or more volunteers who are working to through the legislative process to instill positive climate action. So that's 350bayarea.org. So that was my state level thing. At the federal level, I also uh, got involved with Citizens Climate Lobby uh, to put a price on carbon at the national level in order to reduce the use of fossil fuels. And if we could have the next slide, please. And then hyperlocal. So being part of Star King Unitarian Universalist Church, I became involved with the Peace and Justice Action Team for Star King, our small little church right up Kelly Hill here in Hayward. And they show up to events and every they meet once a month on the second Sunday of the month after service, so about noon. And they, they show up and take action, among other things, for, uh, for the climate. Uh, additionally, Citizens Climate Lobby, the Castro Valley chapter, here uh, with the leader of that chapter, Claudia McDonough, and we're meeting with Eric Swalwell's representatives to talk about climate legislation that he could support um, uh, its passage. Okay, next, please. Thank you. Okay, so why is it that I act? I asked you that question, like what, what compelled you and why? Well. This is where I like to bring in Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy is, uh, and Chris Johnstone wrote the book, Active Hope. And here's a quote that I'm gonna share with you. Uh, and then we'll go a little bit more about a special offer you can have to get this book. Active hope is a practice like Tai Chi or gardening. It is something we do rather than have. First, we take a clear view of reality. Second, we identify what we hope for. And third, we take steps to move ourselves or the situation in that direction. Rather than weighing our chances and proceeding only if we feel hopeful, we focus on our intention and let it be our guide. Next slide. So the point of the matter is, is that action alleviates fear. 
and it empowers you and it inspires other to, others to do the same. And by doing collective climate action, you amplify the effect. So action helps. All right, let's take, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and bring you to what's happened since. So that adapting to rising tides study, that regional project certainly impacted me, caused us to take actions collectively as an organization and for me to, to connect further with other groups. Well, the city of Hayward responded immediately and continues to respond. So I'm so proud of the city of Hayward. And here's a little bit about what they've been doing in these 10 years and where we are now. So uh, the climate action plan, and they are now adding an environmental justice element. You can have the next slide, please. Great. So here it is. There was an initial study in 2010 that the city of Hayward and Hard was involved with, Hayward Area Recreation and Park District, that led us to being chosen to be the site for the Adapting to Rising Tides project that I was referencing in 2011 to 2013. So uh, Hayward, City of Hayward continued with an additional resilience study after that. And from that, they developed a Hayward Regional Shoreline Adaptation Master Plan, which was done from 2019 to 2021. Next slide. Now you'll see that that's part of the Hayward Shoreline Planning Agency, Hayward Areas Hope HASPA. It was established in 1970 and it is now acting as the coordinating agency planning uh, the, the activities to adopt and carry out the policies to protect the Hayward shoreline for future generations. So definitely sea level rise. Next, please. So the city of Hayward has adopted very strong climate action goals. So a climate action plan, it's now part of their general plan. And their, uh, their goals are to 30% below 20, 2005 levels uh, by 2025. And then by 2030 to reduce that level by to 55% below the 2005 levels and then to hit carbon neutrality by 2045. So that's uh, what this updated climate action plan will establish. Um, so on the path to carbon neutrality by 2045, very aggressive climate goals. Next, please. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, they're updating this general plan right now, climate action plan update and adding an environmental justice element. So they're in the process of doing community outreach. And so here's more information. Next slide. So there's a project website. There's a survey that, that those of you who live locally in Hayward, please take the survey, give your input and you can influence local public policy. Isn't that cool? So here's what they're doing and I'm very proud of the city of Hayward for doing so. Next slide, please. So, um, okay, and if you wanna get further involved, you can also uh, organize a focus group. So I'm actually gonna be doing a part, participating in a focus group tomorrow as part of Star King UU Church's uh, Peace and Justice Action Team meeting tomorrow. All right, and there's Eric Pearson's email if you wanna uh, an update or get involved further as well. All right, thank you for that. Next slide. So, okay, we know that action alleviates fear, inspires others, and empowers you. Uh, but how do you keep hopeful? There's a lot of stuff. So um, I'm going to, here's where I'm going to introduce you to Catherine Hayhoe. And uh, she's just come out with a book called Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. So let me just, uh, let me just uh, read this quote to you. So Catherine Hayhoe is a Canadian climate scientist living in Texas, who is called, quote, one of the nation's most effective communicators on climate change, end quote, by the New York Times. So she shows that one of the most important things that we can do to address climate change now is to talk about it. Facts are only one part of the equation. We need to find shared values in the other person, 
in order to connect our unique identities and life experiences and our loves to collective action. So the connection is no minor thing. The connection allows us to reveal our loves and our inspirations and to share that with somebody else. And because of that love and that inspiration to then move together, to be compelled to, to protect it, to save it. So it's a positive feedback cycle. Once again, Catherine Hayhoe. When we feel empowered to act individually and communally, that makes us not, more, not only more likely to act, but to support others who do. And it inoculates us against despair. You're not paralyzed if you're able to act and you influence others to act too. And together we can make a difference. It adds up. Every act matters. Every year matters and you are not alone. So here's where I'd like to say my partnership and my connection to Books on B and Hayward, our local independent bookstore, and Renee Reddick has um, given us a special offer. So if you order either of these books by uh, through Books on B, you'll get a discount on Saving Us. You get $5 off. And Active Hope, you'll get 22% off, um, realizing that the second edition is about to come out in, on June 14th. So many thanks to Renee and Books on B and support your independent bookstore. Yay. All right, next slide, please. Here's some other sources of inspiration. Not sure if you're aware of this. There's an organization called This Is What We Did. Um, they have some great uh, information. They have a workshop you can participate in and how to have conversations about climate. They give you practice sessions and tools. Also, just an easy one is the climate literacy quiz on their website, and the answers have the links to research. So while it's straight up front, ac accurate information, it also gives you the hope that we can transform things, transform things. So inspiration and hope from this is what we did also. Next slide, please. Thank you. Ah. Oh. We were at a rally in San Francisco on March 25th. It was run by youth and attended by youth, and it was put on by Fossil Free California. Um, and this is youth versus apocalypse, right? They're speaking to this group of preschoolers who have their own signs and banners watching them talk about what can we do to support SB 1173, which is the fossil fuel divestment bill to get the public retirement systems of California, CalSTRS, CalPERS to be divested from fossil fuel. So there's lots of information about it on that link that's just been put in the chat. And also there's the website. And we actually are, have some hearings scheduled for June 22nd. It's in the assembly in the Public Employment and Retirement Committee. So we'll be the 350 Bay Area Action will be calling in and saying the Me Too. And we've already got our letter of support in and we'll be um, advocating uh, by meeting with our legislators in the month of uh, July. And then it'll also go uh, to the Assembly Judiciary C Committee on June 28th. So things are happening. The legislation season in California is a two-year process and it ends at the end of August this year and they take July off. So we're in the middle of it and these kids are part of that as well. And they're calling for California to do the right thing. And that inspires me. Next one, please. And then lastly, I just wanted to say, you know, we all have spheres of influences. I happen to be, you know, part of Castle Valley Library. I like Youth versus Apocalypse. I go to San Francisco. So there are ways that you connect. I love the Hayward Historical Society. I'm part of the Hayward Arts Council. I go to Books on Beat. There are connections everywhere. And if you can bring up climate in the common love, you can do things. So um, the Castle Valley Library is gonna have me participate in their in-person and on Zoom uh, climate panelist uh, next Saturday. And it's gonna feature uh, Amos White from 100,000 Trees for Humanity and Jan Hardesty, who's the founder of Forrester. So we will continue this conversation next Saturday and there's information for you right there. Okay, next please. Great, 
And so staying hopeful is acting, acting together, and here are resources to support you. So, so there's, if you want to know more about 350 Bay Area Action and how to actually participate and influence in California state legislation on a volunteer basis, here you go. Links are there. Citizens Climate Lobby, all sorts of good things listed there. I, I also want to point out, it's not just the youth getting involved. There's a thousand grandmothers for future generations and they are not to be messed with. Boy, if you get on their list, they will be showing you which actions we can take together. Uh, and I'm, like I said, I'm proud of the city Hayward for updating their climate action plan and including the environmental justice element. Um, for learning, I wanna point out that Drawdown Drawdown is both a book and a website that shows what is possible to bring down the carbon levels so they can get hope and inspiration from that. Information sources, where you get your information from, and this is just a very short list of possibilities, realizing that every one of these has their own lens and viewpoint and bias, but it's a good place to start. So there's information for you, and I hope that it helps in your climate actions in the future. Next, please. And lastly, I just wanna thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Hayward Historical Society. Thank you, Carolyn Sandoval. Thank you, Marces Owens. I appreciate you. Thank you, Books on B, for the special offer and for Eric Pearson for giving me his slides from the city of Hayward. And mostly thank you for caring. And I hope this inspires you. And so now I guess we're gonna take some questions and answers, right, Carolyn? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we wanna thank you guys for joining us this afternoon. And please, uh, we're taking questions uh, for Jennifer Coney while we have her for the next few minutes. Um, so feel free to just go ahead and put your questions into the question field or even into the chat and we'd be more than happy to uh, pose those questions for her and also while we have your attention of any of the links that you've seen in jennifer's um, presentation today you will be able to find in the chat um, and we can also make those links available to you after the fact if, if necessary so um, Jennifer, I have, I have a quick question for you. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to see uh, some of your paintings at the Alameda County Library over at uh, the Castro Valley branch, um, but I know that they're no longer there. Where is the next place where people will be able to see the paintings or, or are we not quite sure yet moving forward? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'm going to bring at least one, maybe two, to the discussion next uh, Saturday at the Castro Valley Library, and then I am open to sharing these. As you can see, I will cart them, and with my <laughs> handy uh, installer, my dear husband, Ray, uh, we can bring them wherever in order to have a conversation to initiate talk. So I'm not sure where else after the Castro Valley Library, but I certainly am open, and thanks. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. And you have exhibited at the Hayward Public Library as well. Did I understand that correctly? Or? I think I did a presentation before they renovated the library. Ah. Uh, I don't know that they've had a chance to actually exhibit the paintings. Oh. So I have at the Sun Gallery and um, let's see where else. Of course, at the Hayward Shoreline Interpretive Center, which is where we launched it. Um, yeah been shown around Hayward, but maybe it's time to go from the Hayward Library. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I was just thinking of their lovely second floor space would uh, lend some beautiful light to that. So. That's true. Yeah. We do have our first question here from Clint Hawking. Uh, he would like to know if you have a favorite piece from your collection. Ah, good one. Yeah, you know, it, I, that's a really interesting question. It depends on what I'm needing to do. So if I'm trying to communicate one thing and one thing only, it's perhaps it would be this one with the canary in the coal mine and the carbon footprint. It kind of shows the yeah. process. It shows the iceberg. It has the metaphors in it. Um, and and, and I, I just like the way it looks, of course, as well. Then if I just want to sink into some beauty, there's the glacial lake one. And that's the one, it, it, it doesn't show up as much on the slides but it's got so many translucent layers of that glacial blue that I matched to what is only glacial blue. And here's a tip, that blue is only, is available in glaciers because of how the compression over the thousands of years alters the structure of the molecules and the refraction of the light creates that blue. So matching that blue, 
to be in that lake over layers and layers. And there's just something very, uh, when I have the spotlight on that one, it just goes deep. So I, I really appreciate that. Thanks for the question. That's a good one. So it looks like, I think we're still getting a little bit of silence. I'm not sure if anybody is still mulling over your presentation and may have some, some questions for after the fact. Uh, but just uh, while we have you, we'll let you know that uh, for those of you who are watching today, if there's any part that you missed or perhaps there's something you wanted to go back over, this has been recorded and will be featured on our YouTube channel. Um, when that is available, we'll make sure that all of our participants have uh, a copy to access to that link. Um, and of course, if there's any questions that come up to you uh, after the fact, you are, feel free to give us an email and we can certainly get an answer for you from Jennifer Coney. We uh, hope to continue to have a very strong relationship with her here at the Hayward Area Historical society. So, Great. So I, I guess just kind of giving everybody want, their opportunity. I did want to say uh, Rui said I hope I hope he can see my they can see my painting somewhere in Hayward soon yeah. and love to do that. I'm sure we can work something out and thank you for that support. And I appreciate um, the thoughts and support and comments in the chat and uh, look forward to connecting with you in the future. And um, I don't know if you've got my email in order to connect further, but it's jconey, J-K-O-N-E-Y at comcast.net. And thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. you have stayed till the, the end and uh, seen, the, seen the presentation and offered your comments and suggestions and I really appreciate it. I hope this was inspiring. Well, thank you again, Jennifer. We really appreciate it. And thank everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in one of our next virtual programs. Thank you for coming. Have a good day, everybody. All right. Thank you.